Hi. On this channel, I have reviewed a lot of test instruments over the years, from digital multimeters to oscilloscopes and everything in between. One of the instruments I found very useful is an arbitrary waveform generator. I reviewed a UTG962E a couple of years ago, and ever since then I have been using it almost exclusively in many of my review videos, and it has certainly exceeded my expectations. So when I saw a similarly specced AWG from O1, I was eager to get my hands on one and I wanted to see how well it stacks up with the UTG962E. So I contacted Banggood and they agreed to send me this O1 DG2070 for me to do a review on. The DG2000 series has two models at the moment. The 2070 has a sample rate of 300 mega samples per second and the highest frequency it can output is 70 MHz when the output waveform is sinusoidal. The other model is the 2035, which has half of the sample rate at 150 mega samples per second and the maximum output frequency is 35 MHz. Anyway, as usual, the product link is provided in the video description below and you can check it out if you are interested in getting one. From the specifications perspective, the DGE2070 is definitely much better than the UTG962E. For instance, the maximum sinusoidal output frequency on the 2070 is spec at 70 MHz versus the 60 MHz on the 962E. The sample rate is also higher on the DGE2070. It is spec at 300 MHz samples per second versus 200 MHz samples per second for the 962E. And for certain signals, such as the RAM signal, the maximum output frequency has improved from 400 kHz on the 962E to 2 MHz on the 2070. Other than these minor differences, the hardware specs are quite comparable. Both of these AWGs have a vertical resolution of 14 bits. One of the major selling points of the O1DG2070, in my opinion, is its arbitrary waveform generation capability. It claims to have 150 built-in arbitrary waveforms to select from versus the meager 23 built-in arbitrary waveforms on the 962E. And perhaps the biggest advantage of the O1DG2070 is its ability to persist user-generated arbitrary waveforms via the supplied PC software onto the device itself. Now, why this is a big deal, you may ask? Well, if you recall, when I reviewed the 962E, the biggest disappointment I had was that it could not persist a user-created arbitrary waveform. The only way you could generate a user-defined arbitrary waveform is to connect the 962E to a PC and download the edited waveform and use it while you have the 962E part on. Once you power cycle the 962E, the user-defined waveform is wiped from the device memory. So this makes it virtually useless if your job relies on user-defined arbitrary waveforms. For this DG2070 though, you can actually store the waveform on the device itself for later use which is a big plus, so we will definitely check it out later on. Another feature on the 2070 that you don't find on the 962E is its burst mode. We will take a look at this mode later as well. Now, of course, the pros and cons are not just one-sided, as there are definitely a few advantages for the Unity 962E. For instance, unlike the DG2070, where you only get two of these output channels, the 962E has a third channel that is multiplexed among the frequency counter input, external modulation input, and sync signal output. Now, the external modulation input is limited to FSK modulation only on the 962E, which is not all that useful in my opinion. With the extra channel though, you can also use the 962E as a frequency counter if you wish, and also you can use the sync output as a trigger to sync the generated waveform on the oscilloscope when you are dealing with a complex arbitrary waveform. And this is especially useful when you are doing a sweep. The irony here though is that the arbitrary waveform capability on the 962E is quite lacking compared to that on the 2070, so it would be much more beneficial if the third channel were to be included with the DG2070 instead. Another advantage of the 962E is that the output impedance can be configured as either 75 ohm or 50 ohm besides the high impedance mode. Whereas for the 2070, you are limited to either high impedance or 50 ohm. The 75 ohm impedance is useful when you are working with AV equipment. Although you can always use an impedance matching pad to convert between 50 ohm and 75 ohm, 
the matching pads themselves are quite expensive. So it could be a deal breaker if you are primarily working with 75 ohm equipment. But for the majority of people, 50 ohm impedance is adequate. These are just the differences in spec I spotted on paper, of course. Now let's take a look at the device itself. The DG2070 comes in this rather unremarkable generic cardboard box. Inside, you will find all the accessories you will need for the device to operate. Besides the device itself, you also get a, by the look of it, a USB adapter, a North America power adapter, a USB power cable, and this is powered by 5 volt USB, but it's using a barrel connector instead, and a BNC to BNC cable, a BNC to alligator clips adapter by the look of it, and uh, that's pretty much all the accessory you have in the box. You also get a high-level spec sheet along with a printed copy of the Getting Start Guide. Detailed user manual can be downloaded from Owen's website. Although there is companion software for the DG2070, we don't have an included CD. You'll have to download it directly from Owen's website. And this is quite common practice nowadays, as you can always find the latest software on the manufacturer's website instead of relying on a stale copy. Putting the DG2070 and the 962E side-by-side, side, you will see that the general layout of these two units are very similar. The 962E has a slightly bigger LCD, 4.3 inch versus the 3.6 inch on the 2070. Both of the LCDs have the same 480 by 272 resolution. These two units are very similar in height, but you can see that the 2070 is about one inch wider than the 962E if I put them like this. You can see that it's protruding by about one inch. And if I turn them side by side, you will see that the side profile of these two units are also a little bit different as well. The 2070 also feels quite a bit heavier than the 962E. We'll have to take a look in our teardown later to see where this actual weight comes from. Now, my first impression of this DG2070 is that it has some ergonomic issues compared to the 962E in its design. Given its small size, you may not want to use it upright like this, as it's not heavy enough and you cannot operate it using just one hand. So if you look at the 962E, you will see that the power adapter and the BNC connectors are both on the side. So this means that you can use it either upright like this, using both hands or one hand, or you can put it flat facing upwards and it stays flush with the surface. And this is very sturdy, so you can press the button with just one hand operation. Of course, the power comes from this side, so there's no issue at all. Whereas for this DGE2070, you can see that we actually don't have the side output, and the power is from the back. So this actually has a problem. If you plug in the supplied power cable here, you will see that you won't be able to lean it backwards on its back and this is just very awkward. And also, even without this, because of the side profile, you can see that this whole unit actually leans backward, nevertheless. So therefore, it is not designed to lie flat. So instead of using the factory supplied power cable, I did find one that has a right angle, and you can see that this one plugs in, and I, I suppose, if you really want to, I can kind of lean it backwards like this. And this position is uh, by no means stable. It will easily tip over, but uh, my worry is once I plug in the BNC cable, it's just gonna add a lot of clutter and weight in front and probably will tip over regardless. But anyway, we'll give it a try later on to see how well it uh, works. Anyway, that may just be my personal preference, and I'm sure I can get used to this eventually. If you have a strong preference one way or the other regarding the design, please share in the comment section below. And now I have hooked up to a scope, let's power it on and take a look. And it boots up uh, relatively quickly. By the way, this is the first time I'm powering it on. By the look of it, the factory has defaulted into this uh, sinusoidal waveform and it's at 1 kHz, so let's enable the output. And of course, let me uh, adjust the scope here to acquire the signal. And that's a 1 volt peak-to-peak, -peak, 1 kilohertz sinusoidal. 
And uh, one neat feature of this DG2070 you can immediately see is the commonly used waveforms are actually at the bottom. You can press those and they will swap between different uh, waveforms, which is very neat. This is only one button operation, whereas on the 962E, if you recall, you have to do two button presses to change between waveforms. Now you probably saw that when I was uh, switching the waveforms, you see these temporary glitches on the oscilloscope here. I don't recall seeing that with the 962E, so let me actually power it on with the 962E on a different channel, and we'll take a look side by side here. Okay, so right now I have hooked up the 963E to channel 2 and I'm triggering on channel 2 only. You can see that signal right now is the sinusoidal here showing. And I'm going to change it to square. You can see that the transition is actually very smooth. Now it's pulse, now it's ramp, and we do the arbitrary waveform. You can see that the transition is actually very smooth, whereas what we saw earlier on the 2070, there is a little bit of a glitch. Now, my guess would be that the output buffer is not gated in the 2070 implementation, and that's really not a big deal at all, but just want to point out the difference here. And while we're here, let's do some measurement just to take a look here. So let me enable cursor, and let's take a look here. So by the look of it, it's about, well, this shows us at 10 volts, that's because the input is actually at times 10. Right now we're doing a time one, but nevertheless, it is essentially one volt, 1.024, and that's pretty much spot on. That's good, as we're outputting a one volt peak to peak signal on this uh, signal generator here. And since we can output up to 70 MHz, let's just uh, do that right away. And uh, let me increase the output frequency. Let's see what is the best way to do that. Actually, by the way, you have multiple ways to do this. You can use a knob to adjust. You can see here, let me just zoom in a little bit more so you can see on the arbitrary waveform generator here, hopefully. You can use a knob to change the frequency as you saw earlier, but also you can change the different uh, digits here. For example, if I come to megahertz, you can change this, essentially changes to megahertz. Or you can just use the keypad. Let's do 60 megahertz. And that's the 60 megahertz here. Let's uh, do a auto and we'll acquire that signal. It looks really nice here. We, of course, can increase it to 70 megahertz. Whoa. So it looks like from 60 megahertz to 70 megahertz, the amplitude changed quite a bit. Now, that may be because we don't have the termination, even though this is actually high Z. So supposedly this is matching the input impedance of the scope. But this is actually quite normal. We saw the same behavior on the Nexus 2E as well. When we change the frequency, the output level may not be all that uh, uniform. So now we're at the highest output frequency for the sinusoidal, which is 70 MHz as they suspect. So no problem at all. And while we're here, you can see we do have the ability to change frequency or period, and we can change amplitude or just the levels. And here we're changing the, for example, the amplitude, which essentially changes the waveform symmetrically. So for example, two volts. And also we can kind of come down here if you want to change the high level or low level separately. So you can see that we can change the upper boundary and uh, the lower boundary of the signal here. And if you go down, let's go down here, low level, you can change independently. And this is a nice feature. And also we can change the phase. You can change uh, the phase. Essentially for one signal, it doesn't really matter as we're triggering around the signal, but you can change it to shift, for example, 90 degrees if you have two signals. Now let's take a look at the square waveform. And now I have switched it to the square wave signal and you can see the transition. I just want to show you one more time. That is indeed more exaggerated than the 962E. For square wave signal, the maximum frequency it can output is 20 MHz, but you'll see that that's actually limited by the rise time of the signal. So if I just uh, change the time base a little bit, you will see the rise time here. So we're at uh, 10 nanoseconds per division. Let me enable the vertical cursor here. You will see that we're at roughly, well, let me just uh, change it a little bit. So this is here. 
and this one, let's go here. So it's roughly 15.5, 16 nanoseconds. So that's roughly the rise time. I think the spec rise time is 16 nanoseconds. And that's roughly in line with what we're seeing on the scope here. But my point is, when you are increasing the frequency, for example, right now we're at one kilohertz. If we're increasing the frequency, you actually don't get a different rise time. The rise time is fixed at that 16 nanoseconds. So let me increase it to 10 kilohertz at a time. You can see that right now we're at 100 kilohertz and I'm going to increase to one megahertz. And uh, we're going to do 10 megahertz. That rise time stays the same. And of course, now we're at 20 megahertz. The waveform actually doesn't look all that like a square wave anymore because of the rise time here. Again, there's nothing wrong with this uh, waveform. And that's the same with the uh, UTG962E as well. So let me change it to the REMP waveform, of course. The REMP the highest frequency it can handle is 2 megahertz. And if we further reduce the frequency, you will see that actually the signal is very clean here. So this is at the 400 kilohertz, 500 kilohertz. For the REM signal, you can also change the symmetry of the signal itself. For example, right now it is at a symmetric one, and you can definitely skew it one way or the other. So that's the standard REM signal here. Before moving on to the arbitrary waveform, I do want to show you the pulse signal as well. So here's the pulse. And for this signal, you can see we have a few more parameters you can change from. The phase is something we already know. And now let's take a look at the uh, duty cycle. So let's change the duty cycle and uh, let's press. So now it's at 48%. We can change it, let's say to, in this case, let's do it 10%. And you notice that the rise time and uh, fall time, we can also have finer control over here. So for instance, we are changing the rise time to be smaller. And by the look of it, we can only bring it down to about 20 nanoseconds, maybe a little bit, yeah, 15 nanoseconds. Okay, so that's actually the limit of the rise time as we mentioned earlier. So I would assume the fall time, we can also change it to 15 nanoseconds. So this is actually the pulse that you can see generated from this uh, DG2070. And one of the predefined buttons here is for noise signal. We can take a look. Later on, we'll show this on the spectrum analyzer as uh, we can see how flat the spectrum really looks. But right now, let's skip this. Let's go to the arbitrary waveform. And for the arbitrary waveform, let's actually reduce the frequency a little bit because uh, some of these waveforms are very complex. And uh, let's do a one kilohertz. The complex signals, if the frequency is too high, it might be distorted. So let's just uh, reduce it to one kilohertz and acquire the signal again. And let's uh, take a look here. So these are the arbitrary waveforms. We have the built-in ones. Let's uh, see here. By the look of it, we have quite a few different categories. Let's do common. Wow. So here is what we are talking about. You can see we have quite a few of these arbitrary waveforms. Now, if I remember correctly on the 962E, if I just switch between the arbitrary waveforms on the screen here, it will actually change on the scope. But that doesn't seem to be the case on this DG2070. It would be nice if you could see the output changes when you cycle through these different waveforms it will give you a nice visual indication of the arbitrary waveform you are currently working with. Unfortunately, you have to actually select it. Let's just select it, okay. You have to select it first in order to see that waveform. And uh, given how many there are, it would take you forever. So let's find an interesting one first to see. I'm not going to go through all of these. Let's do the staircase, uh, staircase up. That's a very useful signal. And let's see that. Yep, we have no problem capturing that signal on the scope. Now let's take a look at a few more signals. Of course, if I want to change it, I have to come back here again, which is a little bit annoying. The common signal here, you can see that we have quite a few. I suppose the good news is that you do see this preview of the signal on the screen here. So you would be able to tell what approximately you're looking at. So these are some of the common signals. 
And uh, let's go take a look at the other ones. There's uh, medical treatment. Oh, we have this uh, heart signal. So let's uh, put that on the screen here, shall we? That looks just like what it said here. And uh, let's take a look at another one. Again, I have to come back here, built in, medical treatment. And uh, let's do uh, EEG or EOG. It doesn't really matter. Let's do EOG here. Yeah, so this signal, you can see that we definitely can't trigger it properly because we don't know when the start and end of the signal is. And this is where that sync output would be very useful if we were to have that on the 2070, but we don't. You can always just stop the signal and you can see what that signal is. So let's go back. Obviously, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but you can see we do have other waveforms as well. And there's quite a few of these standard and let's go back, see what else we got. Wow, you have the mathematics. And uh, so as I said, there are about 150 of these arbitrary waveforms. So clearly, pretty much everything you wanted to do, you can find it here. Actually, I don't know if you would ever need to generate that yourself, but if you do need to, you have the capability to generate the waveform by yourself. This one is a damped oscillation. So let's take a look at here. We generate this waveform with no problem. And of course, just like the 962E, not only you can generate a waveform, you can also do modulations as well. So let's uh, go back and see the modulation. So for that, we're outputting currently a sinusoidal. And by pressing the mode button, you can actually do the modulation. So right now we're at a amplitude modulation. So let's uh, reacquire the signal rather. And we can probably zoom it in a little bit. And you can see here, we actually have this uh, amplitude modulated signal. Now, of course, this is not triggering properly just yet, but uh, we can adjust the trigger a little bit to trigger on the signal properly here. And this is just an AM modulation. Of course, we can change the carrier frequency, we can change the modulation depth and uh, modulation frequency as well. Let's take a look at the frequency modulation here. The frequency deviation currently is at 100 Hertz. Of course, if we change the frequency deviation here, ah, deviation. Yeah, the deviation now it's, uh, you can see that on the screen here, we can definitely capture the frequency modulated signal with no problem. As mentioned earlier, one of the features we have on this 2070, but we don't have on the 962E, is the burst capability here. So let's take a look. So for the burst signal, we can choose the burst period. Let's uh, change that period to be a little bit shorter so we can see that. Let's do actually 100 millisecond. And cycles, you can see here, we can do how many cycles we have. Now, cycles. We can turn it to two, three. If we zoom it out, you will see that this is essentially, the signal is generated at uh, every 100 milliseconds and we have three of these bursts. This is useful to test some kind of a transient signal and uh, perhaps even digital circuitry as well. One thing I want to add is while we're in this burst mode, you can see we have the trigger, right now it's set to internal. We also set this to manual mode so in this case, we can press the knob here and you will see that we are actually triggering the burst. So that's just a different way to trigger the burst signal here. And what we mentioned earlier, we also have the ability to do sweep on the signal generator. So let's take a look here. So the sweep here, you can either do linear or logarithm and here we're in linear. So you can see that the sweep time is set to one second and we can do start frequency and stop frequency here. Recall I mentioned that this DGE2070 does not have a sync pulse output, unlike the 962E. Unfortunately, that is where this would be very helpful if we do have that output, because right now you can see that we are not able to trigger on the sweep time here. So this is one second. If we were able to trigger on the sweep time, we would be able to plot a bolt plot here. 
With that said, you could adjust your scope to the appropriate time base and also utilize its single shot capability to actually simulate the triggering. So let's just take a quick look here. So let me change the sweep time and we'll illustrate how do we do that on this oscilloscope here. So the sweep time, let's change it to one millisecond. Let's do one millisecond. And uh, let's uh, change the stop frequency at, whoops, the stop frequency, sorry, to one megahertz. So let's first change it to automatic internal trigger and uh, we are gonna change the time base to, let's see, So now I have set up the sweep to start at 100 hertz and end at 1 megahertz and with a sweep time of 1 millisecond. So if you take a look at time base here, right now I set at 100 microseconds. That roughly represents a 1.4 frames for the entire screen display here as we have about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 as we have 14 of these horizontal graticals here. Of course, because we cannot trigger on the sweep signal here, so you can't see where the sweep starts and where the sweep ends. But if you use the stop, you can see that we roughly stopped at uh, the middle here, and this is where we started the sweeping. So if you run this uh, capture multiple times, uh, once in a while you will get the entire frame from the beginning to the end. And of course, that's not very convenient because you don't have this trigger, but nevertheless, with a modern scope, you are able to actually capture the frame of the sweep. And now let's take a look at a signal on the spectral analyzer. For that, I am currently outputting a 10 MHz signal at one volt peak to peak. And uh, let's observe on what we got. So it currently is sweeping between five MHz and 80 MHz, and with a frequency resolution bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. And the signal itself looks actually very clean. Essentially, it is a similar characteristic as what we have seen for the 962E. And if I increase the frequency, you will see that the harmonics will change accordingly. Some point is higher, some point is lower, but uh, nevertheless, it is all in line with what it is spec. So now we're at uh, 50 megahertz, 60 megahertz, here is a 70 megahertz. You can see we have significant harmonics in the lower band. And the reason for that, I won't get into the detail, but most likely it has something to do with the architecture of the DDS. So the noise you see here are essentially two components. One is the harmonics. The other is the phase noise from the DDS signal generator. And that is dependent on the architecture of the DDS and also the filtering from the output. With that said, you can see that the output spectrum is very similar to what we have observed on the 962E. And now let me enable the noise output. Let's take a look at the noise spectrum here. By the way, we are currently stopping at 80 MHz, so you do see a little bit of roll off, but uh, the bandwidth of the synthesizer is spec at 70 MHz. You can see that the noise output is actually very useful as the output is relatively flat across the entire supported frequency bandwidth. It is not as flat as the 962E, but it's good enough. And because this is essentially white noise, you can use it to characterize the frequency response of filters and amplifiers. Now I'm doing sweeping between 1 MHz and 17 MHz. As you can see, we can see the envelope on the spectral analyzer. And to let me change the stop frequency to be 70 MHz. And also let me enable maximum hold. Now you can see the spectrum actually looks quite clean here. And one thing I do want to point out is that the frequency response across the spectrum analyzer here is not as flat as what we have seen on the 962E. But nevertheless, it is flat enough. And here's an example of what you can do with this uh, frequency sweep. For that, I have actually currently hooked up a crystal that is in series. And you can see that the frequency response, we have a peak between 10 MHz and 21 MHz. And that peak corresponds to the frequency of the resonance of that crystal. So if you look at here, it is roughly at 16 MHz. And if you look at the crystal itself, it is indeed a 16 MHz crystal. 
Now, because right now we don't have a tracking generator, we actually have to do the max hold. And this is not as convenient as with a tracking generator. But nevertheless, because we're measuring the static characteristics of the crystal, this uh, method doesn't really have any issue. As you can see, we have that uh, resonant frequency measured on the screen here. Of course, if we are actually doing the sweep, you will see that you are not able to see that clearly. So now let's uh, do the maximum hold. And it does take quite a bit of time for the signal to stabilize. As we mentioned earlier, you can use the supplied waveform editor to design your arbitrary waveforms. When you create a new arbitrary waveform, you will need to specify the number of points. Here I'm just going to use 8K, which is the number of points a lot of uh, factory default waveforms use. And you can vary this number depends on the complexity of your waveform. Now, the software itself is quite rudimentary, and you can't really create waveforms that precisely, which is really a pity. The only way you can draw your desired waveform is either using lines or freehand, as you can see here. Now, once you are satisfied, you can save the waveform onto the device itself. Now, remember, this is actually a key advantage of this DG2070, as the arbitrary waveform can be persisted onto the device itself. And if you recall, on the 962E, once we power cycle the device, user-generated waveforms are gone. Now let me bring this over to the workbench and take a look at this arbitrary waveform on the oscilloscope. And now I have powered on the DG2070 again. Right now we're showing the sinusoidal here, so let's move to the arbitrary waveform manual here. And if you take a look here, we have two different tabs here. One is for built-in, which is what we're displaying here, and the other one is user-generated. So I press the store. This is where user-generated waveforms are stored. So if I press enter, you'll see that we have a list of user-generated waveforms here. And uh, let me just show you. You can see the first one is a 16K. That's the one we just stored onto the device itself. So let me bring that up. So let's do a call out. And you can see on the screen here, that is the waveform we actually just generated. Now, it looks slightly different because I think the horizontal is a little bit off. So let me expand this a little bit. Yep, you can see clearly that it is the waveform we were just drawing on the computer screen a while ago. And by the look of it, we can actually store quite a few of these user-generated arbitrary waveforms. Let's see how many. Okay, it seems we have 16 slots for storing user-generated arbitrary waveforms, which is plenty. Of course, so far we have only tested the single channel, but this DG2070 does have two channels. Now, I'm hooking up both channels to the channel 1 and channel 2 of the MixSec back there, and I'm trying to output a 70 MHz. You can see here is from channel 1. To switch to channel 2, I simply just press the channel 1, channel 2 button, and now it comes to channel 2. So I can enable the output. You can see that the signal is displayed on the oscilloscope here. And one thing neat about this DG2070 is also when you are displaying channel 1 and channel 2, you can not only swap them around here, and this is actually indicated by the color of the channel indicator here. You can see the yellow is for channel 1, cyan is for channel 2, but also you can use this both button to show them side by side. So right now you can see that both channels are in display here. So right now the active channel is channel 2. You can turn it off and turn it back on. Another thing I wanted to point out is, although we have two channels, these two channels actually are sharing a common ground. Now, this is quite common for the majority of the signal generators out there, but for some very high-end signal generators, you do have truly independent output where they are not referenced to ground. Okay, it's relatively easy to take this thing apart, and there are a couple of cables coming from the back side of the case. 
to the front via these two connectors. And this is actually a, by the look of it, a power supply module. Here, that cable is for the USB riser board, and that is the USB connector back here. So on the back side of the case, everything is fairly simple here. And if you recall from the 962E teardown, we actually had a two board design, but this one essentially is just a single board here. Now, this board back here, that is, as I mentioned earlier, a power supply, but by the look of it, we actually have more power supply components on this side as well. Towards the bottom here, obviously, this is our main PCB. I did remove the heat spreader that was uh, mounted here earlier, and also there is a shielding hand that is shielding the relays here. And besides the heat spreader and the shooting can, we also have quite a few of these heat sinks on the PCB here. And that probably explains why this unit is a little bit heavier than the UTG 962E. Towards the right side here, that is obviously the power supply section. By the look of it, we have quite a few supply voltages here. Now, these two are linear regulators. These are 7805 and 7905, which provide the plus and minus 5 volts. These two vertical ones are actually 17815 and the 7915, as you can see here. Let me see if I can zoom in. Yeah, you can see the markings on the chip here. Now, these are the regulators providing the plus 15 and minus 15 volts. The main application processor used here is an F1C200S, which is a fairly beefy ARM processor. Now, we have seen this chip used in many Chinese-designed instruments, and here we have a flash memory for this application processor. This large chip with a heatsink is presumably the main FPGA. Now, I'm not going to remove the heatsink as it's glued on, but interestingly, you can see here, the heatsink was actually not quite aligned with the chip. The chip starts right here, but you can see that the heatsink is actually misaligned, so it is quite a bit off to the side. Well, I guess it didn't really impact the thermal dissipation that much, as otherwise the waveform generator would overheat and not operating correctly. But obviously that was not the case. But interestingly, you can see here, this is actually quite a bit off. Let me just zoom it in a little bit more. You can see that this is essentially hanging on the side. Anyway, so that's the main FPGA. Towards the middle here, we have two chips. These are the MXT2144, which are 14 bits high speed DAC. Now, according to the datasheet, it can operate up to 210 megahertz. There are two of them, of course, because we have two separate channels. The datasheet also claims that these are AD9744 compatible, and if verified, this would be a huge deal, as the 9744 costs almost $30 each, and these chips are definitely much cheaper. And I'm not sure if you can spot this botch wire here. Let me just zoom it in a little bit more. Let's see here. You can clearly see we have this uh, magnetic wire from this side of the capacitor all the way up to this side of the capacitor here. I'm pretty sure there's some defect in this PCB as I wouldn't think the designer would call for a wire connection like this. So perhaps the other side layer, for whatever reason, the wire was not connected. I'm not sure, but uh, this is very interesting to see a otherwise very tidy board with a botched wire like this one. The other chips, let me just zoom out. The other chips, including these three and these two, are actually all op amps. These two op amps, these two are the THS3096, which are dual high voltage current feedback op amp which I assume are used to drive the signal output. Now, these op-amps are also very expensive as well. The other op-amps, these 8-pin ones, these are T9352. They are high-voltage rail-to-rail output op-amps. And let me move it uh, up here. And in this section, you can see that there are essentially two sections, one for each channel. These are just the relays controlling the output. Now, you can see that this relay itself is actually placed at an angle, which is very interesting. And here's towards the top, you can see the data code of this board was manufactured back in December 2022. So that was actually quite recent. Now that's pretty much everything that is on this board. 
And here are a couple of pictures from the teardown of the Unity UTG 962E. And you can see that the board layouts are very different compared to what we are seeing here. Forgot to mention that from a specification perspective, the decks used here are actually the same as the deck used in the 962E. And in the 962E, they used AD9744 instead. And that's pretty much all I wanted to cover in this video. All in all, I must say that the DGE2070 is an excellent dual-channel arbitrary waveform generator. While in some areas I prefer the good old 962E from UNIT, the arbitrary waveform capability of the DGE2000 series really puts the DGE2070 ahead of the competition. I'll be using this DGE2070 as my primary signal generator in the near future, and I will report back if I see any issues with it. Well, I hope you find this video useful. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more in-depth video like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.